Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Hear Me Dragons. It's me again, Steve, Stav, Steven, whatever. I should actually change my uh, name to reflect that I'm comfortable with being, being called any of those names, which I will do right now. Yeah, there you go. Steve, Steven, Steve, Stav, whatever. It doesn't matter. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Hear Me Dragons. Um, this week, I will be discussing uh, history in world building and uh, going to do that through a couple of different sort of lenses, okay? One of those is going to be what I like that other people have done, some mistakes that I've made along the way, and some of it is also going to be like, what is the history of my world? Uh, but I wanted to start with like, with a with a couple of like broad thoughts <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> um yeah and uh the overall like see history is important to any game world tolkien uh, tolkien had it for uh lord of the rings dune has history star wars mentions its history so like it's obviously an important aspect and you might kind of think that um, starting with history is the place to start, but it's really not. Um, we're doing it first in this series. People wanted me to talk about it first. But if you're doing world building, history is not the place to start. Uh, theme is the place to start. Uh, <laughs> I see people are trolling already. Um, yeah, uh, so, like, when your world, I guess it depends on what you're world building for, so I'm going to be having this conversation really in the context of, like, world building for the purpose of, uh, like, building your, your game world to play D&D &D or some other, um, some other, what do you call it? tabletop RPG. So, yeah. Um, the first thing I wanted to say about that, though, is that it's not the most important aspect. Yeah, it's going to inform a lot of stuff, but I feel like when you're building the history of your, of your world, you want to start with theme and then build history to support the, the themes that you're going for. Um, when I started building my, my game world, which is called Austera, it it did not start with history. It started with what places do I need? Um, and then I started writing history to sort of like backfill the story. How, how, how did this place get to be like this? Uh, it is this way because I need it to be this way for the stories I want to tell. But the, then, then you go back and you write the history in order to explain why such a thing happened. And uh, I am going to share this screen with you guys. This is Ostera, uh, my game world. This is a world map. Nobody ever really sees the world map, quote unquote, in, in the game world. Um, everything is very localized. Most of you who have played in my game world have played in an area that's about that. Right, Iandros is where almost every game I've run in my game world takes place. Not a hundred percent, but like people who have been to that that right there is the city of Sorfin. It's a huge, massive city with thousands and th tens of thousands of people living in it, over a hundred thousand even. But on the you know, it's just a tiny little dinky corner, and yeah, most of my games take place in that one little section of the map but all of this exists to inform the stories that i tell there um and there's a lot of history that uh oh, has nothing to do i just just there because i think it's cool i just noticed something that doesn't have a shadow and, I'm, and now i fixed it and now i'm going to save it there we go um while that's saving i will also say that um having like 
a concise history for your game world is not necessary. Um, I'm a big believer in only write what you need. Um, you, I, you don't need to have 50,000 years of history down pat every major development in order to run a decent game world. Um, thank you, William. I try very hard. Got to start with terrain. Geography determines history. That, there's some degree to that. Uh, I mean, especially in the real world, geography determines history. But I feel like I kind of went backwards. Like I decided, what do I want my themes to be? Then I wrote history to support that. And I made that history fit the geography. Um, and you, one of the things I want to point out about like not overdoing it with your world building is if you watch Star Wars A New Hope, Obi-Wan mentions to Luke Skywalker that his father fought in the Clone Wars. That's all we knew about the Clone Wars until 1999 when episode one came out. Um, so, like, it was just a name that they threw out there, but it gave some flavor, some context to the to the world that they were living in. Um, so, yeah. How often do I find myself improvising history and lore in my games? Okay, so some, and the thing is it gets retconned too. Like there are aspects of the history of this world that are pretty set in stone, but there are other aspects that have been and then went away because I decided I either didn't like them or that they didn't fit my more my, my needs which is another thing that if you're not, you're not publishing your work, if you're just building this game world to play in, everything is malleable. Everything can change. And um, yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading the chat. I was hoping that, Ju that um, Nessie was going to be here this week, but she is on vacation. Um, it's her and Rock's um, anniversary weekend. So, like, I'm not going to hate on her not being here. You know what I mean? Uh, I, so, happy anniversary, Nessie and Rock. And, yeah, hope maybe she'll pop in in a little bit. Um, many of you have played in this game world and know bits and pieces about it. So... Uh, like if you're in the chat and you've got questions, feel free to ask. This is your, your opportunity to get me to, to, to talk about it, like to talk about it, talk about it. So when I think about history, I do think about geography. So I want to talk about specifically the history of Iandros, but in order to get to the history of Iandros, I have to get to Kethmoria. And to get to Kethmoria, I have to get to Arashka. And from there, I have to go actually back up north through the Great Green Sea. And because uh, ostensibly, he uh, is, this is a fantasy world. And uh, this map that you're looking at now is a modern map. Uh, the, the time setting that most of my games are set in are to within maybe 50 years of each other. And this map is very serviceable for all of those sort of things. Um, yeah. So, and when you're dealing with fantasy, ethnic, uh, fantasy races and stuff, you also have to realize that they're gonna have different value systems even to humans and different drives. So as a, for instance, let's zoom in just in the Northern hemisphere, okay? Drenarum, this place here, Drenarum, this is the ancestral home of all humans. Uh, humans started migrating out of there almost as soon as they appeared in this game world, in this world, which was about 10,000 years ago. And in that time, they have spread all over the place. Um, they really do inhabit all of my game world, although they do tend to be 
more in the northern hemisphere. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna paint on the map for a second so you can uh, see a few things. Let me uh, just make a decent sized pen. So for instance, this area right here, Iandros, this is the ancestral home of all elves. The God Killer Mountains, well, that's where dwarves come from. Pariah's Cradle, this is where your orcs originated. Drenarum, that's like kind of your elven homelands. Um, and you had this area was more dominated by halflings. Uh, the Western, their wasteland now, but back in the day, that was all giants. Um, and, and given that it's a fantasy world, it's populated by beings that did not evolve. They were placed here by godlike beings and blah, blah, blah. Um, that happened a long, long time ago. But let me get rid of all these now. Uh, humans, being what we are, we like to spread everywhere. We like to go and we are adaptable to all climates. We are rapid reproducers and we are very savvy with adapting to new uh, biomes, new climates. So um, humans appeared in Drenarum 10,000 years ago, which is actually kind of a world had been here for a while. I'll go back to the history older than that in a bit, but we're going to start here. Um, Drenarum was a bunch of humans that were sort of placed here by the gods. That's, I'm just going to the gods. That's all that I really need to say about that. From there, they started to coalesce into larger and larger tribes. And then some of these tribes people decide, uh, were unruly and they were sort of forced out and they went this way. And then some of the, and then some time passed and some of them decided we don't like the fact that these uh, chieftains are ruling over us all. We want a more, a lifestyle that's more like, um, you know, pastoral, not subjected to everybody among us. They migrated this way. And then some of the Drenarum went, they continued to spread this way. At, but then at some point, there was a rebellion. And then these people the, in, in Shemarim decided, well, they have a bunch of undesirables they don't like. So then they were forced out to here, the Himarik. And if you'll see, notice. Himarim, Himarik, they have the same root word, uh, which is sort of like outcasts. And people think, a lot of people in the modern era will think that Pariah's Cradle has something to do with the Himarik, but it doesn't. The Pariah's Cradle is the home to the orcs. But these people then spread out all across the Great Green Sea until they came into contact with the people that live here. This area is known as the land of the Jesk now, but that's a newer name. Uh, I'll explain eventually. But uh, the migration path actually went like this. So, and that, this is over the course of about 7,000 years. All of these various uh, migrational movements. Uh, but as humans are wont to do, we started to outbreed and force out everyone around us. Um, when you're world building this level of thing, like this is about as detailed as I get for my history until I get into the history that I need. The history of Iandros, this region right here, is what I really need for my game world to work. There's history for other places. Uh, Panu Kapuri has a pretty well-established history. A few of you have been there. Uh, but, you know, I don't have history for everything because I don't need it. You get rid of all these arrows and stuff. And maybe I'll open the Iandros map because it's a lot better. Let's see. 
Where is my big main Andros map? It's going to take a second to load. But yeah, that, that region is called the Jesk because it is home to the people who are known as the Jesk, who are a horse-loving culture that lives in the Great Green Sea. Let me turn off the uh, hexagons as well. So you can see it a bit better. So that is the same region I was just looking at, but this is a much more zoomed in area. And if you really want to get technical, this is the area people actually play in for the most part. A tiny little sliver, a quarter the size of the United States, maybe a third, not very large. Like from Alinde in the west to Lirith in the east is probably 1,500 miles. So this is a large scale map still, but all my history happens here. And let's talk about what did happen. So you'll see Kethmoria down here. Kethmoria is another human empire that is ruled by a fairly ruthless royal family. A long time ago, Morning Bay did not exist. Uh, Iandros, I told you a moment ago, is the ancestral home of the elves, of elvenkind in my game world. They used to, this whole region used to be much more densely forested and it used to be filled with a bunch of elves. You still have the dwarven cities of Karazvarad and uh, Ozumvarin in the north and the mountains, the God Killer Mountains. The dwarves still live there and you'll occasionally see them around down here, but uh, you've still got some elves in the Elvenwood over here in the west, but humans have dominated this region now. And I found myself wondering, like, well, how did that happen? Um, and this all started because the first place I ever made in my game world is this town right here. It's called Crescent. It's the first place I ever invented in Austera, and that was about about 20 years ago. And I have been adding to it ever since so there's a lot of history in doing that uh but I, I found myself being like why would the elves leave what happened why are things the way they are because i i want I, I andros is a place that is for the most part pretty pleasant to live in for most people i mean it's medieval fantasy world so not everything is great obviously there's bad guys and dangerous things that live in off the beaten path but i found myself wondering like why what here why when what how and so i wrote the history to serve the story and so here's here it is a thousand years ago when this whole region was still mostly occupied by elves the humans were continuing their expansion they were coming not only from the Great Green Sea in the east, where they had where they had been living for quite a long time. There's a whole, whole again a horse culture called the Jesk that lives over there. Uh, so they were not only putting pressure from this direction, but people from Kethmoria were also coming this way, and. <clears throat> The elves, being very powerful magic jerks that they are, were seeking a way to halt the advance of the humans. And so they summoned something, a terror from between the stars that fell to earth and then began its march towards the homeland of the humans. So this thing landed here in the ocean and then began moving its way this way in order to destroy the humans. The problem is they got more than they bargained for. They just wanted a thing that would kill their enemies. What they got was a thing that tried to eat the world. Uh, let that be a lesson to you. Don't summon Cthulhu. No matter what the problem is, he's not going to solve it. Um, the important life advice. <clears throat> but then that that cuts off the sort of uh, aggressive expansionistic empire from the humans, which had kind of 
which had kind of conquered this region up to about about here or maybe more likely here something along those lines and that even informs the naming conventions of places like you can tell you can tell a difference in the way things are named sunrise whitewood five roads greendale old tree silver springs humans are really good at naming things like that but then you've got these old elvish cities that have become sort of uh anglicized is not the right word but it's the closest word i can think of but uh sorfin is an ancient elven city anybody that's in my game world that goes to sorfin and there are several of you can tell you that there are they have ancient structures there that predate human habitation and people are like we don't know how that was built it's just always been there and yeah the sorfin is sort of like the humans a close approximation to what the elves used to name that city but the so they summon cthulhu a bunch of gods and dragons and ultra powerful beings got together to finally put it to sleep now, for those of you that have played the shards of heaven campaign you, you've got a lot more of this history already because the shards of heaven is sort of like this thing waking up and it's coming it's it's coming it's it's waking up and the whole campaign is crisscrossing all of iandros in order to get the things you need to make sure that doesn't happen uh yeah it, it basically will take you way up there and then down there and then over here and then back to here and then maybe over here and back and then over to here so you're crisscrossing this whole freaking map several times and if you i'm the dungeon master that is like oh i'm from nelwyn well you got to have a side trip to nelwyn in there before you go there or something like that so yeah there's a lot of opportunity to go all over the place and the history feeds into all of that uh sorfin has its own history sorfin um doesn't keep a calendar like there is no common calendar in any of iandros if you ask somebody in sorfin what year is it they'll tell you oh it's the 17th year of the reign of of duke carson the sixth because that's how they keep time there is no year zero year one year two um which makes keeping history for their part a little bit difficult the elves have a different way of looking at it but their their uh calendar starts ten thousand years ago and they're it's based on the elven perspective of where they started and, and their culture um another one of the biggest pitfalls that I ran into was trying to overdo it with my history, trying to explain everything with a historical fact. You don't need to do that. Um, sometimes you just put a name on there. Uh, five, as an example, five roads. Uh, I mean, look, there's five roads going in and out. Pretty easy to name it five roads, right? But why is it there? Um, five roads is actually there more for economic reasons than historical reasons, but we'll get in that. We'll get into that when I start talking about economy and stuff in another video. Um, in this video, I really want to hone in on things that are historically significant. So after, after the fall of this guy is called Carcathagon Komaroth. You don't need to remember, remember that. So some people just refer to him as Big K. Um, he's a bad dude, Cthulhu monster. But after the fall of that, the elves basically having been used all the magic they had left to summon this thing and then kind of having it get smacked down by the great heroes and powerful beings of the world, they were spent as a force they were spent and so they all retreated back to the elven wood and in the in, in the intervening thousand years or so 
humans haven't deforested this place, but you can tell a difference in the thickness of the woods. So like if I was to make a thousand year old, uh, a map of a thousand years ago, some of these towns wouldn't be there. Some of these cities would have different names. Some of the, uh, there would be a lot more trees. Um, there, there would be human uh, interaction. And I will also say that like the idea that these people who live in Iandros now, um, a lot of them are refugees or settlers who are leaving Kefmuria because Kefmuria sucks. Anybody that's been there knows it sucks. It's a slave culture. It's very stratified. Um, there is no social mobility, really. So it's a terrible place. Most people don't want to be there. Um, Kefmuria is a kingdom. Iandros is not. I in every place on here with a name, so Emmaston, Cresset, Harnstown, Greendale, Sorfin, Nelwyn, Thurgood, they all have, they are all independent city-states, which will sort of control the region around them. Uh, you know, there's large number of villages that will dot the countryside and they'll in, you know, the larger cities will influence those places, but nobody calls himself a king. There are no Kings in Iandros. Like most of them will call themselves Dukes or some of them like Port Kiernan has a, a council of, of wealthy merchants that run the place, but most like Crescent has a Duke, Sorfin has a Duke, Five Roads has a Duke. Okay, Farhaven has a princess, but nobody sells, nobody calls himself king. But that is a cultural consideration based on the history of leaving an oppressive kingdom. They don't have kings in Iandros because if anybody, if 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 the Duke of Sorfin was like, I'm the king, uh, pretty much everyone around them would be like, you are not the king. Let us all get together and convince you how much you're not the king. Uh, hold on. I'm, there's some chat going on that I need to catch up on. Uh, I used to have a duke. I seem to remember killing my father. Maybe, maybe. What about city lord? Yeah, I mean, some of them will have different names. Uh, and again, most of them are vaguely sort of like they're not it's not feudalism they call themselves duke because like a lot of the vocabulary for their for the upper echelons of their society comes from feudalism so that's the words they imported because so, historically that's what they're called um you know a, a powerful local noble is a duke but they in in other places in the world the person in charge here in lyrith would be called a king because that's i mean when you think about the size okay so if this is half you know or a quarter of the size of the united states lyrith and sorfin and like the areas that they cover are the size of full-on states in the in the united states which means they're the size of ancient kingdoms. But anybody that calls himself king is just asking for trouble because the rest of Iandros will be like, no, there we there is no king. Um, and th when I talk about history, I also think about not just what happened when, but who did it. So wars happen all the time here. Um, Really, Sorfin, Port Kiernan, and Lyrith are the big three political players. You've got Alinde way over here, which is also a huge city, but it's a younger city, and it's enough removed from the sort of like main population center, which is here, that they they have less sort of they exert less control over the the general happenings. But yeah, there's wars all the time between Sorfin and Lyrith and Port Kiernan due to, you know, 
okay, you see this village right here? Who who runs that? Who do they pay protection money to? Well, over the course of hundreds of years, both places. Um, five roads. Like, they're right in the middle of everything, so they have to play off all three. And five roads has a lot of, like, there are battlefields all around five roads because of all the wars that have been fought between these major powers. Most, very few people in my game world have ever sort of traveled in this exact area but i have the history because people can travel to that area it does happen sometimes um so again like what only what is needed only what is needed so yes i have heroes that i can talk about uh eric first king who is actually used to have a kingdom here in whitewood um was a kingdom that uh, existed before Morning Bay did. If you'll remember, Morning Bay exists because the elves called down a Cthulhu monster and it started eating the world, as you do. Um, so Whitewood existed. It wasn't called Whitewood, um, but there was a kingdom that kind of covered this area. But it doesn't exist anymore after the cutting, after it got cut off by Morning Bay and after people continued to spread out. And then as people moved into the places vacated by elves, uh, other population centers grew up. Whitewood actually does not have great access to, uh, it's not the most fertile land. Uh, you can. I hope you can tell by the map colors. This is a little bit browner over here by Five Roads and Whitewood. So it's not nearly as, you know, it's not as fertile. You get over here by the chalk cliffs and up the river valleys and up into like this region here. This is very fertile ground. So like that's why a kingdom rose here, but it fell or it didn't fall, but it sort of like decreased in power and at some point this guy was probably the guy who called himself king was probably killed because people were like no you're not a king we don't do kings here um let me catch up with the chat i'm gonna put that on the screen there are also the dukes of hazard county which are more local troublemakers and governing nobility you're correct hmm I used to love that show as I when I was a kid. I wish it wasn't so problematic, you know. And then Wheezy says there are city lords in Blood of Youth, a Chinese wuxia series that they just watched. One city had three city lords. Yeah, um, that's probably more like what they have at, uh, excuse me, in Port Kiernan is city lords. Um one of the things that I so I've I've said don't do more than you need to, but I would say figure out what you think is the minimum you need and then do 50% more than that because you're going to need more than you think you do. Like, why does, uh, again, like I wanted to tell a story about humans that, that you know, a uh, city states that is in a place where it's not their ancestral home. They are colonizers or invaders or however you want to look at it. Um, anybody that goes to visit elves in the elven wood knows that they still have a chip on their shoulder about it. It only happened a thousand years ago. So there aren't any elves alive that remember it, but there are elves alive whose parents would have remembered it um, because it's only a thousand years. Elves in my game world live to be about 800. Um, before dying of old age. So I wanted, I wanted, you know, what, and the theme is like, they all coexist. Like Sorfin and Port Kiernan are massive rivals and also the two biggest trade partners on this map. Like 
They have this massive river that connects them, the Grand River. It's a very wide navigable river. Sorfin is connected upriver both to Ozumvarin and Karazbarad, which are dwarven cities where they get silver and iron, respectively. But you couldn't tell that based on the name of the rivers, huh? But, uh, yes. Yeah. So, like, everything from uh, the high-quality foodstuffs and wine of no or of no one flows down there harnstown makes excellent excellent wine that flows in there old tree is known for its um well they're they're gnomes and in dnd gnomes are sort of tinkers and inventors so that all moves into sorfin uh crescent has fantastic quality stone that it trades again i'm getting into the economics a little bit um but that is that feels into history because Port Kiernan are trade partners. They're also rivals for control. So throughout the history of the of this game world, there is the the push and pull of like we make money off of each other and then we fight each other over who controls this and that. Because Port Kiernan, if you'll notice, in Iandros, there is one major port city. There are a couple of other minor ports. Alinde is kind of a lesser port. Southwatch, Sunrise, they're both sort of lesser port cities. But Port Kiernan, being at the mouth of a river, is the only major port in the whole region. So anything that comes from sort of outside Iandros, or we'll say probably like 80% of it, comes through Port Kiernan. The other 20% comes through the other three ports. And it's probably only local to them. Um, if you're, if you're in Hamill, which is named for Mark Hamill, by the way, I have all kinds of tributes to people I love and admire on this map. But if, if you have silk and you live in Hamill, that silk came from across the Sea of Lost Hopes into Port Kiernan and then that way. It's the only way to get it. You can't make silk here. We don't have the, the don't have the stuff for it. Don't have the, the right kind of worm here. Um, and uh, and the same is also true. Like anything that is exported out of Iandros, pretty much all of it leaves from Port Kiernan. But when you're talking about the hi history, like you don't, I don't need to know how many battles, how many died, when they were fought. I just need to know that in their history, there have been many battles. And in a specific game, I can add to that along the way and be like, uh, okay, so people want to, you guys are right here on the map. Um, that brush is a bit thick. I'm going to skinny it down a little bit. You guys are right here on the map. That's an excellent place for there to have been a battle between Port Kiernan and Sorfin in the past. And if that's what I want to do, for that game group, that's fine. And the next game group that comes along, there can have been a battle there if it continues to serve. Or if it doesn't, it can be gone. It can be not there. So, like, the idea of, like, having a solid history is something that I actually don't always go for. And one of the things I've told several people before as well is that like, there are things about the history of this game world that I intentionally don't know. There, It's a high fantasy world. Uh, having all the answers removes all the mystery. Even for me. Like, if I have the answer to every question somebody asks me about the history, there's nothing left new for me to discover about it or to change or to make relevant for each individual gamer. So that's one of the things that I think is very different between world building for a tabletop RPG and world building for almost any other reason is that your purpose for doing it is different. If I was going to publish this in a book, it would be different, but I'm not publishing it in a book. I'm giving it to five or six people at a time. And it just needs to be make sense and being internally consistent for that gaming group. 
And even uh, I've run the Shards of Heaven campaign for four different groups now, and it's different for all of them. Uh, but when I do stumble on something that I really like, uh, which is like, Dan asked me, how often do I just sort of like wing it? Uh, I, I don't do that a whole lot anymore, but there was a time that I did because a lot of it wasn't done. Now, uh, like there are things, uh, history is not where I've done the most work, honestly, because I don't feel like it's the most important. I feel like culture is the most important thing. And I cannot wait to get into just talking about Ian Josie culture. It's fantastic. I love it. But like, I, I don't need every aspect. I need enough for it to be convincing. I need enough room to, to let it grow and to let the people that I'm playing with add to it. Cause that's another thing. When you're sitting down to play D and D your players are going to come to you and be like, I want to be from X, Y, Z. And this happened. I've got a lot of place in my game world where I can say, okay, well, sure. Let's say you're then you want to be from a place and you want this to have happened. Okay. You're from a little village here near Sokai. Right. And now as far as the history of your game is concerned, this village right here near Sokai was raided and burned and destroyed. And now there's a, an evil cult that has set up shop there. Great. That doesn't need to exist in every iteration of my game world, but it needs to be available for the players to add in their bit of it. Because the game world belongs to all of us, ultimately. If you're playing D&D &D with me, you, uh, you need to be able to have some effect on the game world. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So I'm going to go back to the other map for just a second. Um, you have unsaved changes. Okay, I don't care. I don't really want to change. I want to go back to this. Um, because I do want to give you a couple of the hard facts about Ostera, with some of them that are, are set in stone, so to speak. So I'm uh, just going to draw your attention to the bottom of the map. Um the world of Ostera, the names are all color coded. Um, if it's white, it just describes like a geographic feature. If it's blue, it describes a people group. Uh, so like Iandros is a culture, not a nation state, if you will, because this gold color is a polity. So like Kethmuria is a empire or kingdom, but all these things around it. Iandros is just people who talk the same and worship the same and have a lot of the same sort of like customs, but they are not beholden to a single political entity. In Kethmuria, they are. Um, but the, yeah, this is the area we were looking at, Iandros. I'm, I hope you can tell that it's the same. But yeah, if you zoom out, let me talk about the oldest place in my game world. And that is this region right here. That is too big a brush. That's this place right here. The Empire of the First Kingdom. This place is 50,000 years old or more. Okay? It's an island. It's a remote island. It's way out in the middle of nowhere, and it has existed way, way, way back. Um, long, long, long time ago, there was a... Uh, a th this, this world is over 50,000 years old, and it existed as multiple continents for a long time. But then, be this is high fantasy, mind you, but then came the eater of the world eater. And the world eater began doing what it, what it does, eating the world. It consumed all the land mass that the world had left to offer, with the exception of a few islands off to the side. But uh, 
before it could can finish consuming finish consuming the world it was killed it was killed by a, a coalition of powerful godlike beings from beyond the astral plane and it it was killed and when it died it fell back to the world and its bones became the earth hence the name austera that's what austera means world bones or bone world or whatever um and if you look real close you can actually see you can actually see it let me make the brush a little bit thicker to make it a little more obvious but you can see the eater of the world or the world eater if i can get my brush to cooperate okay there's the tail there's the tail that was cut off here's the body this area up here is its crushed head it's even got if you see these like side spurs of mountains it's got little arms and legs off to the side this is the thing that was eating the world and eventually it was defeated fell down and it uh, provided a new world for the gods to then repopulate with humans and elves and dwarves and orcs and halflings and gnomes people who so like i have this place here nobody ever goes there though it's so separate and even if you did like they would feel like aliens to you because they're part of the world before this whole thing with the world eater happened 50,000 years ago. I'm sorry, 10,000 years ago. And then the world was repopulated. And then over the intervening 10,000 years, yeah, humans spread. I'm going to draw the line again. Basically in this fashion. In the north. And then in this fashion in the south and then once they got here they also went this way which leaves only basically this region with base with almost no humans in it um side note for those of you who are watching and and notice like bleak heart is called bleak heart because that is the literal heart of the world eater See that little, that little spot right there? That's, um, that's the heart of the world eater. And um, if you're ever playing in my game world, I'm just going to say, don't go here. There is no worse place in the world to go than here. It, it's, it's a horrible, terrible place. You don't want to be there. It's the heart of a of a well it's this thing is the size of a planet so you figure it out it's the cursed heart of the world eater that was slain by the titans if you will if you get down here i'm going to talk about panu kapuri for just a few minutes and then i'm probably going to wrap up for today um so panu kapuri has its own history that's like thousands of years old and yes, humans live here, but the vast majority they came in through here, uh, you know, a couple thousand years ago, through the one one of the very few gaps. But Penukapuri is dominated by things like Arakokra, Kenku, uh, Harangan. Um, what are some of the other ones, y'all, who have been there? Nessie, Emma, Micah. Uh, Nessie, Emma, Micah. Julie, they've all been there. They're the only they're the only people I played with currently that have been there. But Penicapuri feels very different. Um, big tip for for those of you: don't be afraid to straight up steal from real history. Panu, the origin of Penicapuri. When I was having one of their sort of like diplomats explain their history, it's actually was sort of tied in a lot of ways 
is similar to the history of um, the League of the Iroquois, which is very interesting, sort of like origin story of the League of the Iroquois with with Tadadaho and um, is it Hiawatha? I don't want to speak out of turn. Tadadaho is a name I know for sure, but like their their history, the 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 origin of like how they came together is very similar. So if you uh, look up or read about the the League of the Iroquois, you'll understand a, in broad strokes how Panokapuri came to be. Like, how did all these beast races come together to to form a functioning empire that is as multicultural as it is? Because you've got elephant people and rabbit people and goat people and bird people of all kinds scattered all over the place. And yes, okay, like the boar people are from here and the eagle people are from over here and the elephant people are from here. But in time and because they've worked together for thousands of years they have proliferated all across the region but that's a thing that took history and um they uh, the, my players had a lot of opportunity to travel with uh, some of the court officials and they got a lot of history and culture from them so but some of that some of that i spent months like doing and because I wanted to flavor it differently and I wanted to have like a bunch of beast races, I wanted to be really careful that I didn't in infer that any of the, like I wanted to draw on different cultures. Uh, one thing you'll find that I do in my world building is I don't say this is fantasy China and this is fantasy Japan and this is fantasy Greece and this is fantasy Holy Roman Empire. I don't do that. Um, I want it to be a little more unique than that. Um, Penukapuri has elements of China and India and Mesoamerica in it. But I wanted to be really careful that I didn't be like, okay, this is fantasy India and all the people are animals. That's, that's a slippery slope, y'all. So I, you know, I tried very hard for, for them to be amazing and also suck, which they do. They're, they're, that's, that's another one of my big world building tips in general it applies a lot less to history, but um, when you get to like making NPCs or places, uh, I, I'm always like, what's amazing about this place or person and what's terrible about this place or person? And if I can answer those two questions, it's already got a lot of like personality to it. But yeah, Penukapuri has its own history that like, and they're very closed off from the rest of the world. Like they have one port where everything comes in and out of, and they only trade with these people from this steel slash silk slash spice islands because they're, they're the only ones that are basically allowed to come into this one port city, which serves the whole place. Um, they're the type of culture that's like, hey, we have everything we need except maybe some steel. So they get their, they get their steel from the steel islands. Other people get spices or silk from here. Fun fact, no, neither spice nor silk nor steel is made here. It's just these people have excellent boats and are able to go to cross the sea. And so, like, the you know, people in, in Iandros call them the Silk Islands because that's where silk comes from. People in Penukapuri call them the Steel Islands because that's where steel comes from. Actually, steel comes from up here in Iandros, uh, or uh, they, uh, yeah, steel comes from Iandros. The spices come from Kormash Trig area, and silk comes from Penukapuri. So they all have different names for it, even. But Penukapuri, like, they, they don't play with anybody outside. Their history is one of like a thousand years ago, we coalesced into the greatest culture, and since then, we've been the best at everything. Boats where? Boats, I'll show you, Kelly. See these this island here? The spice steel silk islands? That's that's it. That's where they love boats. Um I'm gonna check the uh chat real quick and then I think I'm gonna wrap it up for today. Wow, that was 55 minutes. I can't believe I talked about 
felt like nothing for 55 minutes. Uh, let's see. I heard Bleak Heart is quite nice this time of year. It, you know what? I will put it to you like this. You will find no better time to go to Bleak Heart. No better time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Potter loves to joke about Bleak Heart. Uh, and since Potter's not here, Emma is appreciating that somebody had to mention it. Um, I will also, oh man, what was it about? Oh yeah. Bleak heart vacation homes. Once you go there, like you'll stay there for the rest of your life. That's if you, if you go to this place, I promise you, you'll want to stay until you die. That might be five minutes, might be three days, but it's going to be pretty fast. Anyway, y'all that's an hour. I made it a whole hour myself. Just Blah, 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 blah. I really had hoped that Nessie was going to be here, but I I forgot it was her uh, anniversary. We may revisit this and have her ask me questions about this. But yeah, come back next week where for another stream about something similar where I think we might get into uh, Iandros, mm, the region more specifically, because that's where my games are set. So it feels like that's the place where you're, I'm going to get the most out of like talking about what it's like there and about the, uh, the culture that exists there. So, yeah. Okay. Till the end of the moon, I have everything I love. Dragons, a three-eyed crow, magic, a fight for the throne, romance, exotic settings, good versus evil, Beautiful music, costume, and storytelling. Where can we watch this? Or is this a book you've read? Just re-watched. Okay, so it's watched. Wheezy, this sounds great. Tell me where I can watch Till the End of the Moon. And, and yeah, I would also like to say thanks to everybody who came and just heard me listen to me ramble for an hour about, you know, storytelling. So, yeah, I don't know how helpful it was, but it was a lot of fun. I had a good time, and uh, yeah, I guess we'll see you all next week. I'm just waiting to see if Wheezy will tell me where I can watch this show before I sign off. You, YouTube, okay, YouTube, hey, that's, that's easy. I'm and dubbed in English. If it's in... in uh, I believe you said that's a Chinese story. Is, is it subbed in Chinese? Because I tend to like original voice acting better. It carries the emotion better. But yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I'll just look it up. I'll look it up myself. But uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. I'm trying to cut this off before six o'clock because that's when my good friend San Rixian is going to start her stream over on Twitch, which I like to watch on Sunday evenings. Um yeah, but next week we'll talk about uh, culture in Iandros, and I will probably have a guest next week. I thought it was going to be Nessie this week. Again, I just planned really poorly. It's my fault. But, uh, yeah, I know I can get Julie easy. I know I can get Emma pretty easy. There's a couple others of you that, uh, but I, I know I need to get Julie in on this because she's played in this game world pretty much as, as much as anyone. Okay, okay, right. I can just keep going around in circles until I'm blue in the face, but I don't want to turn blue. So good night, everyone. Have an excellent week. I will see you all next week back here where we will world build some culture for Iandros. And until then, you know what it is. It's still the same thing as it always was. Peace and be excellent to each other. Bye.